Okay, a couple quick announcements before we get started with Lab 11. Uh, make sure you guys are keeping up on your notebooks, on your drawings, and your labeling. Uh, don't wait till the last minute. Try to do like 15, 20 minutes every day, and you'll be able to keep up no problem. All right, and also bring them to class next time, not for a grade, but just so we can check over them and make sure that you are on the right track. We don't want you to waste a lot of time uh, doing the wrong thing. Okay, so make sure that you uh, are keeping up and that you bring them to your next class so that we can uh, make sure that you get as many points as possible. All right, so we are covering axial skeleton, uh, just the skull today. We're actually going to split it into two parts, the, the cranial and the facial bones. All right, and before we get into that, I just want to give you guys, um, I don't know, a different perspective on bones, right? So... We generally in A&P focus on memorizing structures, um, bones, names, muscles, what, I, what have you. And, and we kind of keep that in the perspective of, of the medical field in some, some way or another. How to treat injuries, how to, you know, is this the first or second step along the way to get to uh, becoming a nurse, becoming a doctor, or what have you. Right? But there's a whole other side to that of looking at how our bones and how those structures of the bones have corresponded with the evolution and our capabilities as a species. Right? So if you look at this image of between you know, two or three million years ago up until uh, 40,000 or, or even you know, to today, there's been this significant change in the structure of our brain. And so it's whole fields out there looking at the consequences of this alterations or this kind of playback and the feedback of how um, the stresses and the needs in our lives help shape the future of our species. Right? And it's interesting to think of that even today uh, our species is still evolving. Our skulls are still changing, you know, and another hundred thousand years we may look extremely different than what we do today. So it's kind of interesting to think about how, uh, you know, we look kind of live in the present in the moment, but it's interesting to think about big picture and where we come from and where we will be going. Okay, so we're covering 22 bones today. Uh, we're, again, we're splitting into both cranial and facial. And we're going to start with cranial and the way that cranial bones are defined is that they're in direct contact with the meninges and the meninges is uh, this kind of shrink wrap covering around your brain right? and so your brain uh, the we'll get into this in a little bit more detail when we talk get to chapter 21 uh, which is dealing specifically with the brain but for right now just know that cranial bones are in direct contact with the meninges and the meninges itself even has three layers the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Again, we'll talk about that in a few weeks. But just be aware that uh, cranial bones are defined by being in direct contact with the meninges. Right? And there's six of them. There's the sphenoid, the temporal bones, uh, ethmoid, parietal, occipital, and frontal. All right? And if you see a two next to it, it means that they're paired, right? So there's a left and a right. The other ones are singular. And there's a couple of mnemonic devices. Uh, old people from Texas eat spiders is one, which is weird, but, uh, you know, sometimes weird is easier to remember. And then pest of six, All right? So each one of those letters is, corresponds with a bone. So you have occipital, parietal, frontal, tex uh, Texas, temporal, ethmoid, and sphenoid. Right? And so then pest of six kind of reminds you that there's six bones in the, that are cranial. All right, here's just another image uh, showing some different perspectives, showing the parietal on the side, the temporal kind of also um, just a little bit inferior to that. Occipital is posterior, frontal is anterior, uh, sphenoid and ethmoid kind of sit uh, behind the orbit. Okay, so we're going to go into each one in a little bit more detail. Uh, frontal bones uh, makes up your forehead. Um, that's really all you need to know. It's shown here in beige. Uh, it's kind of a, the thick part of your noggin uh, right up front. The parietal bones, parietal means wall, and that's what it is. It's kind of the wall of your cranium. Right? And what's kind of interesting 
are key to remember or take away from the parietal bone are the four sutures that are associated with it. Right? And so the four sutures are uh, just different um, points of connection that fuse as you develop, right? So when you're born, you don't, um, those, those sutures are not fused yet. And so you can actually squeeze through the birth canal and it allows your brain to grow. I right? see so if you were to look at babies' heads, they're kind of tend to be a lot bigger than the rest of their body. Um, and they have all those soft spots, those fontelles. Um, and those are from the sutures not fusing yet. All right? And so we'll just walk through the four real quickly. The coronal suture, remember the coronal plane cuts anterior and posterior. The coronal suture sort of does the same thing. It separates the frontal bone from the parietal. The sagittal separates the two parietal bones. It runs mid-sagittal right down the middle of your cranium. The lambdoid, uh, this is uh, separates the occipital from the parietal. And lambdoid, you know lambda from your Greek alphabet. Lambda is kind of Y, upside down Y shaped. Um, and so it's very similar to that. And so if you look at the structure, uh, how the occipital bones meet with the parietal, uh, you can tell it's lambdoid. And then on the side, on a lateral view, it's going to be the squamous. And that's going to separate the temporal from the parietal. And, and so if you look at the squamous itself, it's kind of between that pink and the grayish purple. Uh, bones, right? So the grayish purple is the temporal, the pink is the parietal, and it gets the name squamous because the way it sits down, it actually squishes down some of those bone cells, and so they're flattened and they have this squished appearance. Okay, so we're going to walk through a couple structures. We talked about the parietal, we talked about the frontal, now we're getting to the temporal, and there's a few things that you need to know on this. On the temporal bone, you need to be aware of the zygomatic process. And so the zygomatic process of the temporal bone pairs up with the temporal process of the zygomatic bone to make the zygomatic arch. All right? and so they're just named after the, the, each process is named for the bone that it's in contact with. And so the zygomatic process of the temporal bone articulates with the zygomatic bone and that forms, it doesn't articulate I guess, it, it's connected or fused with the zygomatic bone to make the zygomatic arch or your cheekbones. All right, the mandibular fossa is going to be inferior. That's where your mandible articulates. The external auditory meatus, that is, a meatus is another fancy word for a canal. So this is your external ear canal. You also have an internal auditory meatus, which you can see from interior uh, view. And yeah, so this is forming the inside of or the outside of your ear canal. Then we have the styloid process. Remember we have a couple other styloid processes in the body. They're attached with the ulna and the radius. So you got to be specific here. The styloid process of the temporal bone and this is what connects the hyoid bone uh, through muscles. Right? So the hyoid bone is kind of unique in the sense it doesn't have any bony connections. It just kind of floats there. It's a floating uh, bone. All right, and then right below, behind it is the mastoid process. Uh, this is this kind of round, uh, much uh, larger process than the styloid. And I kind of remember it in the sense that like a mastodon, like a uh, woolly mammoth, they're really big lumbering beasts. And so the mastoid process is this big lumbering process right behind the styloid process, which is going to be like a stylus, right? Okay, so an inferior view or an interior view of the temporal bone, you can see the internal auditory meatus on the left. And then if you look in yellow, um, you can sort of see where the mandibular fossa is. All right, so that's where the mandible is going to articulate. It's right below the zygomatic arch, in particular the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. It's right behind it. The occipital bone, it's pretty much making up the back of your skull um, and a lot of the base as well. It, in fact, it goes right around your spinal cord in a, through a structure called the foramen magnum, right? So foramen means 
hole. Magna means large, so it's this big hole where your spinal cord sits through. The occipital condyles, uh, if you remember that a condyle is kind of like this knuckle area of articulation, like these little ridges, these bumps that kind of stick out, and it's usually where things connect. This is where the C1, the cervical vertebra, the atlas, articulates with the skull. Right? So the occipital condyles sit on the occipital bone and there's smooth areas right on either side of the foramen magnum. The last structure you need to know on the occipital bone is the external occipital protuberance, which is this bump which you can feel on the back of your skull. And if you've ever heard of the term phrenology, which uh, there was a journal of phrenology in the 1800s. Basically, this was a pseudoscience that looked and tried to predict your personality traits or your future mates from the bumps and divots and knocks on your head. Right? And so uh, it's kind of interesting. I've, you know, that, that image right there on the left is a, a Roots album, which I never really called phrenology, which I never really understood until... I learned about the bumps on your head and how those dictate your future soulmate. And the last two bones we're going to talk about in the cranium, the sphenoid and the ethmoid, a little bit more detail to them uh, in terms of the number of structures that you need to know. The sphenoid, uh, sphenoid means wedge-like, and it has this wedge-like appearance to it. Uh, and so it's kind of forms right behind, it makes up the most, the most of the posterior portion of the orbit and uh, it's a pretty important bone in the sense that it's protecting some stuff in the brain. We'll get to that in just a second. So working our way down this list we have a lesser and greater wings. If you remember that lesser means smaller and greater means larger it's pretty easy to identify those two things. We have the body of the sphenoid and so that's going to sit in the middle. It's very similar to the body of a vertebra in the sense that it's kind of the meaty portion and the most medial as well uh, of the bone. And then you have a medial and lateral pterygoid process or processes. Right? And so it's not pterygoid, it's pterygoid like pterodactyl. Just like pterodactyl means winged lizard, pterygoid means wing like pteri, that root means wing. And so you have these medial and lateral wing like processes that stick off the inferior portion of the sphenoid. Pretty easy to figure out which one's medial and which one's lateral because the medial one is going to be closer to the body. Okay, and when you look at a superior portion or superior view of the sphenoid bone, there's a couple other structures that you need to be aware of. The first um, is the cella tersica. And the cella tersica means saddle or Turkish saddle. And if you kind of look at it, it looks like a little seat. And it's composed of two separate structures, the hypophyseal fossa and the dorsum cella. The dorsum cell is the ridge, and the hypophyseal fossa, the fossa means indentation or divot, uh, depression, and so it's easy to kind of distinguish between the two. And why this is important, if you remember that things that get weird names do weird stuff, they're the action spots on the body, and the cella tersica is no different. It actually houses and protects the pituitary gland, and we'll get into that when we talk about brains. Um, but you will be able to see kind of this connection. So this is the house for the pituitary gland. If you look at the lesser wing, it's right below. It's going to contain a bunch of holes um, and openings that allow blood vessels and arteries and nerves to pass through that. And if you think about where the location of the sphenoid bone is, right behind the posterior of the orbit, all this stuff is dealing with eyes, right? So getting stuff to and from the eyes, supporting it. We're very visual creatures, so you really, we need to commit uh, a lot of space and a lot of our brain, actually, to vision. And so stuff doesn't just diffuse through bone really readily, so you need these passageways. So you often see, particularly in the skull, a lot of holes. Right? And on the greater wing, there's a couple that we want you to be aware of. The three that we want you to know are the foramen rotundum, the foramen ovale, and the foramen spinosum. And, and so the rotundum is going to be roundish, the ovale is going to be more oval, and the spinosum is going to be a little bit more spindly. And the way that I remember it is that I always use the ovale, it's a big one in the middle, it's very, it's really always oval shaped, and so it's very easy to kind of use that to orient. 
and then rotundum comes before spinosum, so R comes before S, and then so I can go and I'm, I'm reading left to right, and I know that the rotundum is the upper portion, the more medial uh, foramen or foramen eye. Right, and so here we have a lateral view of it. You can see in the blue the sphenoid bone. You can see the cella turcica. You can see the medial and lateral uh, pterygoid processes. And then from an inferior view, again, you can see the medial and lateral pterygoid processes sticking out uh, in blue. You can also see the foramen ovale, and it looks like the spinosum, right? Because the rotundum is going to be a little bit more medial. And the last bone of the cranial uh, bones we're going to talk about is the ethmoid. This means sieve, and it's dealing with smelling and sinuses and all this good stuff. It's going to form a portion of the orbit, but also uh, it forms a good portion of the lateral walls and uh, roof of the nasal cavity. All right, so there's a couple structures, again, that you need to be aware of. You have uh, what are called the cribriform plate and the cristagalli. So these are forming the most uh, superior portions of the ethmoid. And the cribriform plate is the one with little holes in it. And basically, you have a, uh, your olfactory nerve sits on top of here, not on top of the cribriform plate per se, um, but you have little tendrils that come out and allow us to smell. And right? so you want to stimulate those things. There's this whole sense sensory system, which we'll talk about in, 20, in lab 21 on the brain. But right now, just know that the cribriform plate is associated with the olfactory nerve. At the top of that is the cristagalli, which is kind of the comb of the rooster, the crest of the cock. Um, and so this reminded people of that comb, a rooster's comb. And it sits on top, perpendicular to the cristagalli. And a lot, if you follow that path all the way down, you get to the perpendicular plate. So the perpendicular plate, it's called the perpendicular plate because it's perpendicular to the cribriform plate. All right? And so, again, we're forming part of the nasal septum here. And you tie that in with the ethmoid air sacs and also these things called conchi right there. You're really dealing with protecting the tissues and maintaining uh, sinus pressures and, and dealing all this stuff uh, that are associated with both smell and maintaining the sinuses. All right, and so the conchi, you look at that word shell, and these are kind of these little turbines that help spin the air when you breathe in and protect that epithelial tissue that's lining the nasal cavity. And so we're looking at a lateral view again ethmoid bone is in green. You can see the cribriform plate. You can see the cristagalli on top. If you look right below it, you have those conchi, and you have a superior and middle conchi, and those are structures on the ethmoid bone. You want to compare that to that kind of pink-looking slug, just inferior to the ethmoid bone, and that's the inferior nasal conchi, which is a separate bone, right? So they're not fused together. They serve the similar purpose and if you look at the inferior nasal conchi it's c-shaped so it actually looks like you're looking at a c and then a re inverse c okay so we just covered the cranial bones and we're going to go in the next uh, section the next uh, powerpoint ab lecture we're going to get into the facial bones